try to give you uh, our um, idea about um, how you, we need to think about smart cities in the future. And when this term uh, is mentioned, uh, the smart city um, uh, vision we have is about, uh, all, all about efficiency uh, and the ability to forecast and anticipate events. So the smart city vision of the industry uh, promises that we will be able to reach our destinations fast, uh, we will be able to uh, predict when there will be traffic jams and avoid these traffic jams, uh, and even get into a self-driving car, drive through the, rest, through the city, reach our destination, and we can still even work while uh, we do that. Is this really the city uh, you want to live in the future? I hope not, and I, I don't want to live in the city. So cities are uh, the paramount instrument of innovation and wealth creation, uh, and today in the era of globalization, they are also melting pots of many different cult cultures. So cities are essentially living organisms, and the city dwellers are basically the nutrients that they need in order to thrive and survive. Uh, by putting emphasis always on uh, efficiency and predictability, what happens is that we uh, get disconnected from our peers and also from the rest of the urban environment. Would you always like to eat every day the same food? I, I, I don't think so, and so are the cities. They don't want the same thing every day. Um, so what, what we need to do is that um, uh, we need to have a complete rethink of how we think about smart cities. Because the industry, uh, ver the industry vision of smart cities, at its extreme, it will transform cities from living organisms to robots. And robots, th there's nothing wrong with robots. They can do many nice things, but they are not uh, very social, and they are not uh, the characters that I would like to hang out with. So we need to, to in order to avoid this daunting scenario, we need to radically change our mindset about uh, cities and how we think about uh, the notion of smart cities. We need to place people into the epicenter of our efforts, and basically we need to cater towards objectives of improving their quality of life. Let's take as an example uh, how urban navigation happens today in the era of smart cities. So if you want to go to a destination, you just take out your phone, you tap your destination, you take turn-by-turn -turn directions, you follow them, uh, and you reach the destination possibly the fastest way possible, without having to interact with anyone else uh, in between. In the past, when things were less smart, uh, or at least this is what they tell us, uh, things were more social uh, and, um, uh, there were, and more serendipitous. So we had to stay connected with our urban environment in order to be able to not miss any turn. We didn't have the directions at hand. Uh, and this might lead us up, stumble upon a nice uh, street art right, and enjoy it. Or we might stop some passerby and interact with uh, him or her and ask for directions to reach our destination. And who knows, maybe potentially a chance at finding love. Uh, Ariel Sabar, uh, in her book, The Heart of the City, describes uh, stories of love and serendipity in uh, the streets of New York. All of these elements are now lost, uh, and m we put a lot of emphasis on, on efficiency. We have become prisoners of uh, time, and we, want, we feel stressed, stressed to reach our destination as fast as possible. Because mainly, this is what we have been told we want to do. Uh, so, what we, the smart thing to do is basically to change this mindset and uh, start considering what will improve the quality of life for people. In some cases, it might be the fastest route. It might be reaching our destination the fast uh, way possible, but in some other cases, it might be following a path in the city which will trigger some emotions or some nice memories and will uh, help you feel better. In fact, uh, Daniela Gertzia from Bell Labs and his colleagues have studied what, what urban sceneries uh, make people feel happy. And using this information, they have recommended paths uh, that make people feel happy when they go through them. So inspired by, by, by the work of um, this group, we extended this question. We said people are multidimensional, uh, are multidimensional characters. They are not interested only in one specific thing. What if they have multiple objectives? Uh, can we actually uh, suggest paths that potentially um, uh, are, uh, try to, uh, to provide optimization over multiple objectives? So what if someone wants to um, uh, follow a path that maximizes uh, the exposure to street art, but at the same time minimizes uh, the exposure to allergens? This might be conflicting 
uh, objectives, can we provide algorithms that do that? And, and we have done. But even more is, can we learn from the breadcrumbs that people leave on their digital devices what they like to do in the city, what places they like to go, and why they, they like to go there? Right? So can we learn what makes them feel happy or other emotions? So still, this requires technological advancements, it requires machine learning, it requires artificial intelligence, but now we put people in the epicenter of our objective, rather than just efficiency. Another possible negative externality of this turn-by-turn -turn directions that we get uh, from our devices today uh, might be the fact that they might hinder the development of spatial cognition. Uh, and in fact, there are uh, studies that have shown that. So what if instead of giving turn-by-turn -turn directions, we just get a series of uh, uh, landmarks that we have to go through in order to reach our destination, but we don't tell people how to reach these landmarks. We let them explore, explore the urban environment and reach these landmarks the best way they think and they feel about it. So this control and predictability brings back some of the uh, serendipity that we have lost today. It lets people connect with the environment, uh, it, le it, it lets people um, uh, see what's going on around them uh, and hopefully improve their quality of life and makes them feel less rust. This is uh, what we believe it's the smart thing to do. Now, as another example, let's uh, consider uh, that of public transportation. Uh, Enrique Penaloza, which is uh, a celebrated mayor from uh, Bogotá in Colombia, once said that an advanced nation is not one where poor use cars, but one where the rich people uh, use public transit. And I couldn't agree with that uh, more, but we all know that taking people outside of their cars and uh, having them use public transit has been a very hard um, uh, task to do. Uh, now, there are many reasons for that. There are many reasons that people uh, do not turn into public transit, uh, but two of uh, the most important ones might be uh, the stigma that's associated with public transit and that it's ingrained in us as we grow up. Uh, and then the potentially bad quality of experience that we have, uh, uh, that we have uh, observed when we have used public transit. However, the latter is um, actually is the result of a vicious cycle. So you start by not using public transit for various reasons, for example, for the stigma associated with it. Uh, and then what, what it means is that port authorities need to cut down on services. Most of them actually operate uh, at a deficit, so they have to do something uh, to be able to operate. So they cut down on services, which means less frequent service and even worse experience, because now buses are cramped, buses are old, the infrastructure is bad, so you keep getting worse and worse experience. So the industry comes again with a smart, visit, a smart city vision uh, and gives us a solution, right? We have ride-sharing services. Uh, you can uh, fire your application, uh, get a car on your door. Even this can be a self-driving car, so you can reach your destination, no need to look for parking. Right? That's, that's what this, uh, the smart city vision of the industry tell us, uh, tells us now that you can do. Leaving aside the possible negative uh, externalities that uh, these uh, this this solutions might have in the total number of car trips in the city, which studies have shown that they have a, a very big negative impact. Um, this solution still isolates us from the environment. Right? Imagine if you have a ride-sharing service with a self-driving car, you don't even have a driver to interact with. Right? So you're completely isolated both from uh, your fellow city dwellers as well as um, uh, the urban environment. So is there another solution to this problem, uh, to um, uh, improving uh, the quality of uh, public transit and getting more people into public transit. Obviously, port authorities have thought about that, and they are interested in doing this. Um, uh, and they have tried many, many things. Uh, all of these things are around the same central way of solving the problem, which is congestion pricing. So they are looking for a smart pricing uh, scheme where basically uh, will incentivize people, instead of using public transit at the peak, during the peak hours, uh, to make them use it other times and uh, balance the load across, um, across the different uh, buses, which hopefully they hope they will uh, get people better experience and then more people will use it. However, the results obviously have been uh, far from, impre from impressive. So what we have um, been thinking in, in, in this uh, project in our group is can we 
do something radically different than just congestion pricing or some variant, uh, smart variant of it. And likely we have thought about it and we have found a possible solution, a promising solution. So Port Authority and commuters are not the only stakeholders uh, when it comes to uh, transit in general. Local businesses rely a lot on transit, either public or private, in order to get customers to their establishments. So what if we can think of, of creating an ecosystem where all these three stakeholders synergistically work together in order to incentivize uh, and improve the quality of experience that you get uh, when you use public transit? Now, obviously, this needs technological advancements, but again, we are uh, putting the emphasis on commuters and city dwellers. So just to give you an example on some of the scenarios that we are examining, imagine that you know that the next bus that takes you home is full. So since it is full, you know you will be cramped in a packed bus, you will be frustrated, and when you reach your destination, you will be completely uh, mentally and physically exhausted. Now also imagine that you have some time flexibility and you don't really need to be home within the next 30 minutes, but you have some time to spare. Wouldn't you use an incentive from your local, uh, favorite local coffee shop to go and get a free coffee or a free pastry, interact with the other people that are there, and possibly um, meet your future spouse? What a great uh, story that would be, right? Uh, getting married because of an uh, incentive to use public transit. So actually, our first uh, survey results uh, that we have by asking people and trying to identify what will work and what not shows that if people have this time flexibility, they are open to this kind of um, incentives. Uh, and we hope that by doing that, what will happen is that people will get a much better experience uh, when they're using public transit and they will become long-term customers of public transit. Now closing, uh, I want to basically uh, that's upon the very first thing I believe that we should do when we're thinking about smart city services. So most of the smart city services today are being delivered through mobile phones, mobile networks, uh, mobile devices. Uh, so you need this technology to get them. And clearly we know that the penetration of these devices is very large today in our society, but it's still not 100%. And in fact, the part of the population that doesn't have access to, this, to these devices and these services might be the one that will benefit the most from these smart city services. So whenever we design uh, a solution to some of these um, uh, challenges that we have with regards to smart cities, we need to always consider how we're going to deliver this solution because we want everyone uh, to be in included. Right? A smart city is an inclusive city and it's one where digital divide, the digital divide will not intensify inequalities that uh, we have. So with that, you can uh, visit uh, the website of our project. You can see the progress and uh, what we have been doing and what we will be doing. Uh, and hopefully today, you will either take the bus to go home or you are going to follow a path uh, that will trigger some nice emotions.